Hey everyone, I will speak from here because yeah, the course is not so lengthy. <laughs> so thanks you, thanks everyone for coming today. And we are kind of part, we're organizers of Barcelona JS. And normally, if you know, we are having events at uh, Plaza Catalunya, Mobile World Center. But today we decided to experiment a little bit and to have like a panel discussion about first not JS, and the second one is like different formats, not speaking, no speakers giving us a talk, but like informal discussion and sharing experience between people from the industry. Uh, so yeah, thanks again for coming. And why I'm talking before the host, <laughs> really, because I'm the only one um, from the panel who is from ITNIC, and I want to talk a little bit about who, uh, what ITNIC is. And ITNIC is a startup incubator, so it's the really great place for startups to grow and to share uh, experiences between them, and obviously to solve problems together. Uh, and so if, you have, well, like, if you're part of a startup, if you're thinking about being the greatest startup, feel free to contact us, it will be awesome. But also, the main problem of every startup is hiring. And I know every company normally hires <laughs> people, but in Ethnic we are looking a lot of full-stack developers. So if you're thinking about just switching or talking about new job opportunities, feel free to contact me after the, meeting, uh, the event. So and now I'm finishing and passing mic to the real host. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to start right now. A uh, couple of things before we start with our panel uh, discussion. Uh, first of all, we have uh, there the information, uh, the website called Slido. Basically, you can go there, enter the code, and you are able to uh, enter the questions there. So there will be a list of questions voting there, and then we will pick questions from there. So if you have a question, just go there, uh, ask it, and we will try to answer it. Um, yeah, so we, dis like, we decided to make the panel discussion because the topic is really hot, uh, how to style applications. There are like a lot of ways how to do that. And uh, we gather actually like one of the best developers in the, in the, in the city. I think like people are really experienced. and. Uh, yeah, let me introduce. First is Eric, and you can. I can say, yeah. <laughs> uh, hi. First of all, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Eric Reisen. I work at New Relic. Uh, I'm working on the platform UI team. Uh, we build libraries, uh, software for other apps to be consumed uh, by the company. So we have, like, I don't know. 10, 15 apps, and we build like platform-wide uh, libraries components uh, that has to work cross app. And uh, yeah, I'm a senior front-end engineer, living in Barcelona. That's it. Uh, what about your technology stack? Regarding CSS or in general? In general. Okay, in general. Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, well, we use all the latest more or less. Um, every app in New Relic can choose whatever they want. So they can go from TypeScript to just vanilla JS. Uh, we also provide tooling. We have like a, a special library that is like automatically configuring Webpack for you with uh, Test, with Jest, with everything you can think of, linting, uh, what else, end-to-end uh, -end test, everything. Um, we use Babel, Webpack, uh, SAS, uh, some teams use style components, uh, we use Jest, like I said. Okay. What else am I missing? What CSS? What about the like, styling part? So for styling, uh, for the platform team, unfortunately we cannot uh, go with something like CSS and JS yet. Uh, I can explain later with the questions why, uh, especially for us, that's not possible. But for now, we're sticking uh, with a more traditional approach where it's just Webpack, SCSS, we use a suit BAM uh, convention to, to do components, uh, the usual auto prefixing, style lint for consistency. Thank you. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Marina. Um, you can introduce. Yeah. Uh, hello there. Uh, I'm Marina Isa. Uh, I work uh, as UX UI engineer at Olaluz. 
and you you will be wondering what what the fuck is UX UI engineer like that's like a mix or what do I do okay so actually yeah it's a mix of product design with front end so I'm like in the middle of both I'm more yeah I've been I have more experience as product designer but uh, two years ago I started working as a front end developer and um, I saw that it was very important to take those <laughs> both departments and put them somehow together because they're actually working on the same stuff but in a different way. So um, I work at Ola Luz. Do you know Ola Luz? Good companies? <laughs> okay, it's a, a Spanish power company. So like Endesa, maybe you know, Iberdrola is like um, a power company, but we have different kind of doing stuff. Like uh, for example, we only work with green energy um, or valors are better, like we don't put the uh, politicians to work on our company, like in this I do. And well, it's a, only works in Spain, but has very cool, it's a very cool company. I'm very happy working on it. And where else do I... Technology stack? Technology stack. So actually we're working with Backbone, but um, like, for example, me, uh, when I work on front end, I don't touch JavaScript much because my experience is not uh, very high. And uh, I work in the HTML, CSS part. Like, I make um, that all the components that we have in the design made with Skate to look uh, and, uh, the same as in the front end. And, uh, what methodology for the styling you're using? BEM. Okay. Because uh, for me, it's like the most similar way of working as in the design with the sketch. I will talk more about okay. it. So it looks like you both using BAM or Suit. Yeah, it's it's kind, suit kind of similar. Kind of yeah. uh, can someone explain what is that for someone who don't familiar with that? You or me? It's, I am both. We can talk. <laughs> you can explain BAM, I will explain Suit. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't actually I don't know Suit, so it will be very good, <laughs> good to listen to you. Uh, I guess BEM is kind of like uh, working with components, like they their their blocks are separate and they have elements inside and they even have modifiers. And the good thing about BEM methodolo methodology is that you can separate blocks from. And different parts of the website, and you can reuse them afterwards. And they they are not dependent each other, so they are very reusable, kind of. <laughs> like, um, for example, uh, symbols in the sketch. So, well, yeah, I guess both methodologies. In the end, what 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 it aims for is just to have very low specificity. Because if you start uh, using like nested selectors, you just end up in a, in a nightmare of maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, Suit so is just like a slightly different convention that you follow. Uh, we like it a bit more because, uh, for example, in Suit you capitalize the first le letter, and it's, it it maps just more. We use React, by the way, in in, in throughout the whole company, and uh, it just maps a bit better to the convention with uh, how React works, I think. Um, but yeah, in the end, they are the same. They try to keep the specificity low. They kind of, you have to manually follow convention to encapsulate your component, make sure that you're not styling <laughs> other components by accident. So that's kind of, uh, kind of the approach, yeah. Perfect. Okay, and uh, the next one is Ilya. Hey, long time no speak. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm Ilya. I'm uh, CTO at Kamalun. Kamalun is a startup in Etnik. Uh, and we are helping people to customize different things. And by different things, I mean like starting from buttons, chapas in Castiano, uh, to stickers, to um, calendars, to a lot of a lot of a lot of different products. And uh, it could sound boring, but in reality, uh, it's really full of interesting tasks because from my previous experience when I was working on SaaS, we, and we were kind of selling uh, air, you know, because when you're selling products, you're selling airs. And here switching to like real 
products in real life, you're facing a lot of <laughs> problems when you're facing real life as a reality. So, um, and being CTO, uh, I'm also sometimes do a little bit of coding, um, but my real challenge is to be sure that my team is happy and their experience is great and their speed is high. So that's why I sometimes like do a lot of uh, spend a lot of time researching different technologies, playing with them on my free time and trying to find the best one. Uh, so today I'm going, yeah, I'm already stealing all your questions. Um, so and about stack, um, currently in Kamalun we have a mixture of things. Obviously it's like one uh, great stack of 2013. Angular and CoffeeScript, and we are migrating to great cool stack of 2017. Uh, it's React, Webpack, and all this uh, hype, and also GraphQL. Um, but in terms of CSS, still kind of no breakthrough was for the last 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 years. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about CSS modules uh, and why they are a different approach to solve to solve to fix CSS, as people say. Uh, and yeah. And just about that, I think. CSS modules. OK, perfect. Uh, Georgia is the next one. Yeah, the last. Yeah, <laughs> last. Not, not the, last, not the hey, least. Hi. Yeah. Last but not the least, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, I'm Giorgio. Uh, I'm a software developer. I, I should say mostly front-end developer, actually. Uh, I, I've done full stack in the past, but last two years, I've only worked on front-end. Uh, I work for a company called Travelper. I don't know if any of you heard of it. Uh, we are a platform uh, to book business travel. Um, we've been, yeah, we are from Barcelona and uh, we've been open since almost three years now. Uh, the stack uh, has been more or less the same these three years. Python in the back end, React in the front end. Although uh, we had a lot of changes uh, for what comes with styling. We started with normal CSS, we went to CSS modules, and now we're using, uh, using style components, which is basically another way of say CSS and JS. Uh, yeah, I can tell you more why. Yeah, that, that would be interesting why and how you were making the decisions and the transition yeah. from like plain old CSS to something more evolved. And right now you're using kind of like a top edge technology. So it would be nice to, to hear from you the feedback. Okay. How it goes. Um, so when I joined the company two years ago, more or less, we were only using uh, CSS. And we were not too good at it, I was, I say. Uh, there was not much discipline. So the classes were more or less, hey, this is a name of class that makes sense. It's not working. We were not doing BAM or anything like that. So it was not easy. Uh, what we decided to do is to switch to CSS modules uh, because CSS modules, so maybe you can explain a little bit better what it is, but basically uh, you have a single file with all your CSS and all your classes. You import it in your JavaScript, more or less, and that is going to rename the classes for you so, 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 the, so that they are unique, so you don't have a class collisions. Uh, and it was okay, it was working. Um, but then style components came out, and actually we found out that it's working even better uh, because uh, it's taking this to the next level, uh, at least for us, the CSS is inside the component. And when you're doing React, everything is a component. So the fact that you have um, sort of HTML, even though it's not HTML, of what your component is gonna look like, and the style, and they're all together, plus you don't have name clashing, plus uh, you can run all uh, the JavaScript uh, code that you want. You can use JavaScript method and everything. For example, we have a list of colors, and if we want it lighter, we just use the lighter function that we wrote in JavaScript. That would be trickier to do with CSS. So for us, uh, it's more like more flexibility. Okay, but it doesn't it goes with a well-known JS fatigue? So it kind of like grows the JS stack then. And then you need to know everything starting from like building yeah. with the webpack and everything. Uh, I'm a bit ambivalent on the JS fatigue topic because for me it's like, uh, oh, there are a lot of people that are making new and amazing thing every day. This is terrible. <laughs> so uh, I have to say, I think 99% of the new uh, JavaScript libraries and tools that come out every day, I have no idea about them. So. We just research what is uh, it's good for us, and we use it. Um, 
Yes, it's a bit difficult, more difficult to start a project uh, that is using style components rather than just CSS because most of people know CSS, uh, but not a lot of know how to use JavaScript, how to use React, how to use them uh, together. Uh, for us, it works because we are building one application and it's a powerful application, so it makes sense to invest that time. If we were probably an agency that makes uh, one website every week a different one, I don't know, we probably wouldn't do that. Okay. Um, Can you compare Ilya uh, yeah. that to CSS modules? Exactly. Are because they still alive after the style components came out? <laughs> Interesting. Because, yeah, for me, uh, CSS modules, and I have like a, a couple of comments uh, there. Yeah, what's the idea of CSS modules? Uh, if we. If we talk about CSS and we ask, okay, what problems do you have when you work with CSS? Everyone will be like normally mentioning global scope because it's the main problem that you have like global styles and from any file you can override or break uh, any other file. And the classic joke when like when two CSS rules comes into a bar, a uh, stool and a totally different bar uh, falls up. So yeah, and the idea of BAM was, and all other methodologies, methodologies, oh my god, in general was to make developers uh, disciplined enough to write uh, styles that way that they are kind of isolated and they are not shared uh, across, they are shared but they are kind of isolated because of the naming that they're using. And CSS modules, the idea of CSS modules was okay. Uh, we already have, it's kind of solved, but people are really bad in doing mundane tasks and doing not like not inventing stuff. So, and they are generally bad in discipline. So let's make machines to do the work. And the idea of CSS modules was okay, you're writing normal CSS with normal names. So for example, class logo or class avatar, whatever. And then through post CSS processor or web pack processor, um, it's this class name converts into something totally not readable, non -readable but unique. Uh, and then from your JS side or whatever side of rendering, you're just like entering uh, automatically referencing this class uh, and you're getting like unique class names but totally readable and separated files. And the only comments to Giorgio, he also told that he, uh, you, I believe you inserted the whole CSS in, as like one CSS module and then you were using them. I did what, sorry? Uh, you said that we uh, like kind of uh, importing all our CSS as one file into CSS module and then we were reusing it, yes? Uh, no, really, no, we were separate. Ah, you were okay, yeah. yeah, maybe I misunderstood. I was importing in the component, so the yes. CSS of the component. Is yeah, a, exactly. So yeah, yeah. so yeah, the idea was the same as soon as React came up and the component starting, started to eat the world. Um, CSS modules was also like a great idea because you could collocate the, for example, React file, the JS file together with a CSS file in the same folder. And then you just go into import that uh, CSS into React and reuse it. So it was kind of cool and then uh, Webpack or PostCSS was totally converting everything to unique style names, which is also was great. But the problem, and JS fatigue, is not only because of the new libraries coming out. The problem is that if you want to use, for example, now even CSS modules and obviously CSS and JS, you need to render on the client side. And there are applications which are still using good old Ruby on Rails or Django, whatever, and they are totally server-sided uh, rendering, and they do not need to have uh, React of like any kind of uh, for client side rendering, and that's like a big problem, I believe, to start using CSS modules or CSS and JS, and that you need to have a special application for that, and which is good for them because you don't need to have it. Yeah, actually, I was going to say that, like, uh, for example, we are not using React. How could we apply? Um, it's only limited for React, right? It's kind of limited if we're talking about CSS modules. Theoretically, like when you have your styles and then they are kind of passed through post CSS, post CSS just emits a JSON file. So if you want, you can write a special render on your backend uh, that can parse this JS file and return you like normal class names and then these strange class names. Um, but as soon as I was like checking this morning, for example, for Ruby on Rails, which is kind of popular, there was no like really popular or bulletproof solution. So everyone was kind of saying use the pack and render on the client side, which is kind of strange. Also about the naming, um, isn't it uh, difficult to 
I maintain an application that has random names with, or well, actually maybe it doesn't have random names because you're actually um, calling it in a proper way, but afterwards has these weird numbers, for example. I mean, I never use it, and that's why. Uh, it's that. configurable, and normally people configure it that way that you have like human readable thing, and then the six or eight symbols of hash. And obviously, then when you want to debug, you can <laughs> just drop the last part with hash and just like, okay, this is my avatar component, or this is my some, I don't know what. So it's still debuggable. But and also, yeah. you don't care about the, the name that was generated. You only, you have your CSS with your class that you define and use that name. Now you have something, we can be Webpack or Post CSS, that is going to do the conversion for you. So you, you never really deal with uh, this weird class name unless you do the bug in production or this kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, in the end, the only thing that's, that you need to use CSS modules is a bundler. Because as soon as you can import and export things, you can import CSS and the bundler can take care of the hashing. So even if you use BAM or, or if you use like a simpler stack, that's the only thing that you need. So React is not a requirement or some other framework. It's good. Uh, we are like moving more and more into the styles in the JavaScript. Like that's kind of like a trend. What about designers? How do they feel about styles being like moved there? I'm a bit hater, kind of. <laughs> Sorry for that. Like um, I'm, I'm feeling like Putting the, the inline styles into the HTML feels so much like 2003, mm -hmm. kind of. Um, and the reason is because uh, in the design part, we're starting to develop uh, design systems. Uh, I, have you heard about it? Mm -hmm. Design systems? No? OK. So maybe that this is the reason, because uh, design works will be closer to the front end and front end, closer to the design. Because uh, there is this trend or this, actually I think it's a very good idea that uh, design is not only how pretty uh, your application is looking, but uh, also uh, a system behind of it, where you have all your elements, where you have all your blocks, and where it has actually a coherence between all of them. And since we're investing all this time uh, in developing design systems that uh, they actually have very, like, um, all the elements in the application, and all the styles that can be used, and how the fonts are going to be, uh, what is limited, what is not allowed to put in the to design. And in the front end, we are just, uh, if we put this CSS into a JavaScript, we are not following that design system that we, the design team create before. So that's the reason I, I like more Ben, because it actually follows the, the same system that has been created before. It's like a connection with, uh, with the system, uh, yeah, with the design system, and I don't know, it, it follows a currency um, in the whole application. But this is like if you actually want to mix design and front end, because if you really don't mm, want to do it, or your application doesn't need it, then maybe the performance uh, in uh, CSS uh, with JavaScript is better. Yeah, just regarding design systems, I, I, I think you can still do that with React and, and, and style components, for example, because in the end, you will just use the component as your API. So instead of using the styles, you use the component props. So you can set, instead of a primary class, you set a primary, t primary prop on the button, for example, and you get the same result. The only thing that I'm not sure about is like prototyping. So what if you just want the visual in a website real quick? Like a lot of style guys just have like an easy way to copy paste, right, in the website. And you just copy paste some st stuff around. Um, 
to prototype something quick, you need to have some kind of boilerplate with React where you can drop in the components. So it's a little bit more technical maybe for some designers, so that's, that could be a downside. But it's still possible, I think, with a design system. Uh, can I tell you how we do it? Because yeah, sure. we do something similar. Yeah, yeah. We sure. actually, uh, <clears throat> sorry, last year we've been working a lot on creating a design system. Mm -hmm. And as Eric was saying, you can still do it with React. It's just that okay. instead of defining the, the class name uh, as a separate component, you have a component as a separate component. And um, we're using uh, two tools at the moment. One is called Storybook. The other is called Style Guidist. Uh, basically, they allow you to see the component um, in a vacuum, sort of. So, you, for example, you have the button, and you can see the button with nothing around, and you just see what, what is this button, how can it look like, can it look big, small, primary, secondary, and all these things. Uh, and then we have uh, something called Playground, where you can just take this component and sort of build a page. So depending on um, how familiar the designer is um, with coding with JavaScript, they can either use Sketch and just leave it to us, or they can try to mock up. And what we saw is that um, many, well, our designers, uh, they started to um, just try variations of what we have in production just by changing the code. In Playground? Uh, in the Playground, or even uh, just uh, spinning up the, the front-end application and try it there, mm -hmm. or in the style guide. But uh, one thing that you said, that I think it was uh, uh, important, um, and, um, I think many people think that uh, CSS modules style components are like the holy grail. That's the solution. Oh, yeah, I just have a small file, I'll import it, that's it, done. It's not really that. You still need a lot of discipline. Uh, they are helping a lot, but you still need to think about, oh, my component it has to be isolated, and it has to respect some logic so that it plays well with everything else in the app, and my colleague can use it, I will understand it in a year from now, all this kind of stuff. So, but you say that with uh, CSS modules, uh, you actually, it, uh, it works. I mean, uh, you don't have to think so much as, for example, in BIM yeah. about the installation, right? Yeah, but well, maybe it's also for you, but you import the CSS somewhere. Mm -hmm. So instead of thinking about the class name, you have to think about the thing where you import it to. Okay. So you import in a button. But how does this button look like? What properties uh, it expects? Yeah, exactly. It's, I think it's the same way as BAM teaches you, okay, we have a block, like CSS modules, try and, like not CSS modules itself, but the idea of React and the idea of components that we are working kind of lately for the last, I don't remember how many. Yeah, we are all doing components. Yes, at different and they are kind of atomic, and yeah. they, you can compose them like a Lego blocks together. And BAM, CSS modules, style components, kind of the same way of solving that, but just like the different approaches. But I have a question for you. Like, is it like a high level? Um, what's the entry point for designers to start editing codes in style components? Because I believe, like, okay, if it's, if it's CSS, it's kind of uh, easier to find a person who can change CSS. But if we talk about React and style components and stuff like that, okay. Uh, well, I'm a bit spoiled because my designers they know how to work with JS, and uh, I have to say that. It's easier because we speak the same language. I had recently an issue where my designer gave me a design and I could not implement it because I couldn't find a way to do it in CSS and uh, in the web. It was not possible. So I was talking with him and uh, we found some trade off, but I didn't have to explain to him, hey, I cannot do it because in HTML this doesn't work. Uh, so he knew, and he actually came up with a solution. He told me, okay, let's do this trade-off, and it's going to work. Um, so I would say I, I prefer to work with designer than no JavaScript, uh, at least a little bit. Um, and the other thing, I think many designers are kind of scared about JavaScript because it, had a, it has a bad name, uh, because it, it was quite kind of bad for a lot of years. Now it's better, but it was very bad. Uh, but if you look at one of our components, for example, it's usually, it's a bit of HTML that you understand, it's a bit of CSS that you know that, and there is more or less usually the same JavaScript in between. Of course, 
I'm talking about a button or an input text. Uh, if you start working with some huge component, that's my job. That's why they hire me. But if you just want to work on what probably call atoms uh, in your uh, methodologies, in a, in a couple of days, uh, it's yeah. easy for them to pick up. What's hard for them usually is to understand that they have to update the snapshot when they run the test in jest. So that's, that's a <laughs> totally another thing. That's the other part. But working on the component, no, not really an issue. Eric, uh, what's your experience? Yeah. Uh, what's your experience uh, with styled components or, or anything else? And how it goes in your company? Are you planning to move towards them? And how it goes with the designers working with your code? Like how deep into the code you let them in and change? Or you're like doing everything by like developers' powers? So that are three questions in one. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me just give some context first, and then maybe you can repeat the question, the second and third question. So in New Relic, uh, like I said, we build like the platform. So we build software that's consumed by, by others. Um, we had many discussions before about, OK, should we use CSS modules? Should we use style components? Should we use any other CSS and JS solution? Uh, in the end, we decided not to go for it. And the reason why is our components, despite, uh, despite that they, like, they need to be consistent and conform to the, to the style guide, to the design system, often, almost always, there will be a slight case that something needs to be tweaked, something needs to be modified, if it's changing a color or something like that. Um, so what happens? They get a component, and for example, they want to style the icon a little bit different. So let's just take CSS module, and I don't think that's possible at the moment with CSS modules. Then we move to style components. So in CSS modules, everything is really isolated, right? Because it's hashed. So if you have a wrapper component with uh, an icon inside, and you want to style the icon uh, a different color when you hover the parent component, that's a bit tricky to do because they are a hash, so you cannot access, uh, or you cannot make this kind of selector. So I believe it's not possible in CS mode. Correct me if I'm wrong. In style components, it's actually now possible to create like the reverse selector pattern, which is quite nice. The problem there is, OK, so in style component is possible, but so you can import the, the icon inside your button, and then on, no, the opposite. You import the, import the button inside your link, and then when you you use that value in your styled component CSS, and on Hover, you change the color. Great. So it is possible with style components, but that means if we're going to use that, all our consumers that use our library, they need to use style components. Because style components work with functions, they get composed, so they need to adopt that. And as, as we make like component libraries, charting libraries, we make these kind of things. And uh, for me, it's, uh, it's kind of a no-go to say, OK, the only way you consume and do these kind of things, which happen quite often, actually, uh, is to use style components. Um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, what were your other questions? Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, this, the second question was uh, about designers. How do you interact with designers? And uh, do they modify the code or not? Uh, no, our designers don't modify the code. Uh, our designers work with Sketch, with uh, Brand AI as kind of like a repository where they deploy the designs. And they use Framer for animations. Sorry if I used the wrong name. And they use uh, what it was, what it was. I forgot the name now. Well, they use another uh, Sketch plugin, I think it is, to create a design language. So they actually build those components, and we can export them to Sapling and get the styles and everything. But we build the components. Uh, we, we do all the technical part for them. Yeah. So they are not uh, modifying it. But they use, uh, for example, InVision, I think it's called, which is kind of uh, a quick way to do the flow of, the, of, of some mockups to do some prototyping. Uh, so they, they use that for prototyping. And they use the design system for that without using the actual code or library. And how, how do you synchronize between the code and the design? You know, like usually the design changes came, and then it becomes outdated because someone else changed something, and it's like becomes outdated 
with the code and actually a couple of versions of design. So what's the way for you to synchronize? Are you using any kind of style guides? Um, well, our design system is kind of a style guide, but the 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 the, 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 the way to update, yeah, I mean, they, they work ahead of us, and then when they finish work, we kind of update the libraries in batches. But uh, New Relic is quite a big company, so like uh, often it doesn't work so well, or, or things get out of sync. Um, but yeah, that's 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 software. So I mean, the design is your guide, yeah. Like yeah. the design is a source of truth. Yeah. Like you're trying uh, to okay. Well, that's our ideal solution. Like, not it's not always the case, unfortunately, but that should be the case. Yeah, yeah. That's how we do things. Um, so yeah, that's that's why we didn't choose to go with uh, CSS modules or style components. I do think, uh, especially some CSS and JS solutions uh, provide even some extra crazy optimizations. Uh, like for example, there's some of them, I don't think style component does it. Uh, so let's say you have a style component that uses on one element some selectors like font size 18 and, and I don't know, font weight bold. So this gets injected in the head uh, under a hash, right? And the thing is, this can be optimized because if another component has this, an, a different select or a different element that uses the exact same attributes, it doesn't make sense to do another hash with the exact same attributes. They can leverage and cache these kind of hashes and use the same styles for two different components. So you can kind of dedupe your, your, your styles, which you can win quite a bit if you think about how many times you use some different CSS attributes across different components, especially on a large uh, component, uh, a large app uh, that can have some significant wins. The only thing, the other thing that I don't like so much about uh, the CSS and JS solutions is, uh, yeah, I think the performance because what happens, well, first of all, also, like, if, if you don't have JavaScript enabled, nothing is shown, that's one thing, but also, kind of nowadays, you, you probably also watch a lot of these, these, these talks from the Chrome Dev uh, submit about performance and stuff, and um, they always talk about delivering everything super fast, and not on your developer machine with good Wi-Fi hard hardware. So you, you need to test on a, on a mobile device that is average. Uh, and the results there always come back that um, on mobile devices, actually, even JS parsing is really hard. So what happens if you use, for example, style modules, uh, you load the JavaScript, it needs to get parsed, and only then the CSS is injected into the head. And yeah, you can server-side render your stack components, but then you're duplicating. You can, ext they, they, I think they have now ability to extract CSS out of it. Uh, that's nice, but you're also duplicating the CSS because now it's in your JavaScript still, the source, and in the static CSS. Um, and then also the dynamic parts, because in style components you can do like, instead of just writing CSS, you can do props and then do some logic, right? This cannot be extracted because it's dynamic. So then you have like, I don't know, it's not so super nice, I think. So yeah, these were the things that we, were think, uh, that we thought about when making decisions and we came back all the time to see, okay, is now the time to adapt to style components or some CSS? Like, nah, not yet, not yet. So yeah, and I, I'm myself quite a, quite a fan of performance and that, that just hurts to me. Uh, and also, yeah, you can you can do the server side rendering, but then you have to do the server side rendering, which should not be an obligation, I think. So that's my thoughts. Did I miss a question? No. Okay. I think uh, guys have something to add for that. Uh, <clears throat> oh, wait, you said a lot of stuff. I think uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. It was interesting actually, but I think we, the the thing is, you work for New Relic. And we work for smaller companies, so we have different uh, uh, requirements. So uh, when we started two years ago, the problem was not having a fast application, it was having an application. Okay. So because we, we started from zero, right? 
So for us, style component was the fastest thing, and we didn't have to uh, create this library, styling library, and share with all our offices around the world. So. Yeah. If we had to, well, probably we would have gone with CSS because it's the easiest. You don't force anyone to use uh, React uh, or anything. Um, about uh, about performance, so far we don't have issues on performance. Uh, but yes, when we will get to the point, there are all the solutions that, that you mentioned. To be honest, I don't know how better. I, I guess they are not as good as CSS because the plain thing is always the best one. Um, but it's a trade-off. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Like, well, maybe I didn't mention it explicitly, but the reason why I said uh, also like the extract CSS is obviously caching, yeah. because if you inject styles in the head, this doesn't get cached. Um, and if you can extract the CSS, this can get cached by the browser and you don't have to. So that's why I mentioned it. I just want to, to clarify that. Yeah, also another, sorry, yeah, an an another thing that, uh, I've been following this kind of solution, so <laughs> uh, another thing that I came across was like a threat of the creators of, of style components, actually. And um, regarding animations, um, also it, it there was like a like a um, how do you say that the reproduction of the problem, and it creates some an, uh, animation. And so in style style components, you can do props and you can do dynamic CSS based on the props that are coming. But for animation, that is actually a bad thing. So the, the actually the creator of Style Components just uh, said, don't do that that way. The preferred way is doing inline styles, which actually makes kind of sense. So, so if you use that kind of solution, they already start to have different paths. You know, for animations, you have to do that. For other things, to, like state changes, you can use the, the dynamic values. Yeah, it was not so so. So super thrilled about that, uh, but yeah, but, uh, it's trade-offs in the end. Yeah, and yeah. like you said, my context is so different. If I just build an app that nobody consumes, I can, I can, I'm the only one that cares about it. I will probably go with something like Stack on But I also yeah. think that people tend to uh, overuse the what uh, what a stack library allows you to do. Yeah. The example with the animation. Yeah. So you always what we try to do is try to use the platform the web as much as possible because there was the same issue when uh, um, less and sas can came out like the, the chain of hell you ident the class and you don't have to do it it's something you can but you don't have to do it and then lastly like in the end it's also you, not to. <laughs> <laughs> We just have like a one-on-one -on -one here. <laughs> now, just to, to make like the complete picture, I think also you have to consider also the, 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 the JavaScript that is growing because in the end, all style components, I believe it's like 35 kilobytes or something in that area. Gzip, it always gets smaller than a lot of people or a lot of people, if you want to have really all the functionality from, from SaaS and less and stuff, you need to maybe import Polish.js to have some functions and extra stuff. So I mean, in the end, it adds up. If you if you think about like your first 14 kilobyte need to provide the whole website, I yeah, mean, absolutely. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it again, adds it's up. Trade offs. Yeah, yeah. Trade offs. Uh, so. Okay. I do want to? <laughs> I can pass. I no, I'm just like uh, a lot of topics here was covered. Um, the first thing I really believe CSS and JS could be faster than the normal CSS in terms of performance. <laughs> now I will open my my, my case here. Yes, rendering performance and like just like if we want like first pain, first meaningful pay and so stuff like that, it could be faster. And I will yeah, explain why. The first thing, the difference between like normal CSS, let's let's put it that way, and any CSS module, so CSS and JS especially, is that you start parsing CSS. As soon as you start parsing CSS, like automatically or anyway, like with any tools, you can know then when uh, and what is rendered and how it's delivered. Because now if we want to start about thinking, okay, I have like 15 or 50 or 100 kilobytes of CSS on my site, now I want to make it fast. How? 
and then it will be like a question how you're going to split because you don't know what classes will go, go in where, how to do the things, you need to do that manually. With not styled components, but other example, for example, Emotion, uh, it's another uh, approach to CSS and JS, and they are doing interesting things because we also need to dif differentiate between what is CSS and JS. Sometimes it's a static thing that you are running JS on top of your CSS and you're getting the build, and sometimes it's uh, something uh, what's running on the runtime and what's going like ins injecting stuff in the head and doing all these things. So emotions kind of hybrid approach, then have a Babel plugin that could analyze your CSS, then deduplicate it, and also if you want it, they could extract it as a different CSS file. So you have kind of the best approach of two worlds, so you can cache it as a result, and you can deliver it as, uh, as a different uh, request. But what they can do even better, they can then automatically extract for your critical CSS. It's the first thing that you can inline with the first uh, requests uh, in HTML or whatever, and have the first meaningful pain way faster. And the idea is not like style components is for the win or emotion is for the win, is that as soon as we start parsing CSS, we can then know more about what we are writing. And then we can obviously optimize it more meaningful way through machines, because machines are exactly for that. <laughs> and they, they done. And for animations, the, there are two things. The first one, we can also need, we need to also differentiate between static animations, it's just like spinners or stuff like this, and stuff that should reflect the user input. As soon as you do like something dynamic or like you're following the button, and button should be like um, an iPhone and all the animations there with springs and stuff like this, the, which uh, totally depends on the state. And if you do animations based on state, I don't think there is another approach except like doing either inline styles so or stuff like CSS and JS because it's way, way easier to do that there. And I think yeah, it was all the topics. Okay, so uh, it was very interesting how the performance, uh, how the old topics that we have been talking about. At the same time, I was thinking about uh, CSS in JavaScript and I was thinking like, I'm worried about the total ins insulation of it. Like, for example, uh, when we work with BAM, we use SAS, and then uh, what we do all the time is like de declaring variables, global variables, and then we are using it for 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 colors, for fonts, for even margins, uh, well, the spacing, and we are also extending classes. Like for example, we we work with uh, the columns of Bootstrap. So we are actually extending classes, and well, in BAM, you are all the time extending classes from other elements. So it makes your your productivity quite faster, kind of, because you don't have to repeat the the same class or the same variable. So how do you work with that when you are totally insulated with CSS in JavaScript? as isolated as you need to be. So for example, we have a list of colors, which is literally an object with all the colors. We have global variables. It's not global. We import the colors, and we use the colors that we need. And for classes, we don't really use classes, but we use components. So for example, we have a component that you can use to search for uh, airports, right? That what the component does is importing the text input component. So it's like it's rendering a text input component with all the styles plus some logic to get the airports. Okay, so it's not so totally insulated. It's not totally. It's you as isolated can as import as and export yeah. element. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's Which I guess is similar to CSS. Exactly. Well. It's isolated on a local level. So, but if you want in CSS modules. Uh, as an example, it also provides a kind of extension of syntaxes, so you can use the uh, like you can use ex a new world called word called composes, so you can compose these classes, and CSS modules will do that for you. And also, you can undo import stuff through like either normal SAS or like through the CSS uh, modules uh, itself. So they're kind of importing CSS in your local component and reusing it. Exactly. 
But the cool thing on top of that, as soon as I said that CSS is parsed, uh, that then you can have um, the tooling on top of these with, like, for example, flow and TypeScript. So if you have the huge list of uh, constants or whatever, like, configuration, you can type it. And then when you're importing it and you're doing a type or whatever, your IDE will tell you, or like, or your editor will tell you, hey, there is no such color in reality. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's already... You can also unit test it. Yeah. I think eventually libraries like React will probably take advantage of it. So they will, which is more or less like Polymer does. It gives you some utility method to use the underlying thing. So I don't think it's gonna, in the short time, gonna uh, kill React, Angular, all this kind of stuff. The libraries are going to use it. Uh, we have we have another question. Uh, how does CSS and JS affect browser caching mechanism for JS and CSS? If it does, uh, well, we already talked about this more or less. Yeah. I'm not an expert in this, but uh, you don't download the CSS file, you download the JavaScript file, and it's gonna get cached by the. If browser. you export, if you don't export, it's normally insert stuff into your head as soon as it's parsed. Okay. And then yeah. there is no cache. Yeah, no, so it's only cache for JS parts. So maybe you have kind of advice how to do better based on your experience, or how are you doing right now, that part of? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will do a classic disclaimer. It totally depends on your project, uh, and you need to measure first. Uh, but in reality, yeah, that's... The mileage might vary. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, but normally, yeah, in, in CSS modules, it's really easy um, just adding one Webpack plugin to extract all stuff from CSS into like a separate file, and deliver it as classic as a uh, way as we were already used to um, so but yeah you need to measure first everything until you do <laughs> any kind of optimizations uh, we have touched like a bit the topic about animations it's not there uh, can you discuss a bit about animations in 2018 or now 2017 how are you doing them are you using CSS or using JavaScript or jQuery <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's just like yeah. me first. Okay, uh, animations. Um, yeah, actually quite straightforward. I think for simple transitions and 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 stuff like that, um, we use just CSS uh, transitions. More complex uh, animations, uh, we use uh, inline styles. With <clears throat> currently in in our project that we're working on right now, we use React Motion. Uh, which works quite nice um, because like often it's not only animating like doing the style changes uh, with animations you need to keep uh, DOM elements in React around even though you try to remove them you need to keep them around for the animation and then you remove them from the DOM things like that and a library like that helps a lot so that's my answer we only use CSS animation I totally like in the project that I've been working on, we don't have really like an very big animations or they're very simple. So only in CSS works for us. <laughs> Already answered, yeah, I like CSS for super simple transitions and as soon as you have like something state related, you either say, no, no, it's too complex, I'm not going to do that. Oh, oh that, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, in reality you are using something Anything based on your component, on your style, either inline styles, CSS and JS, or on, yeah, I believe nothing more. Yeah, but in general, try to use the CSS as much as possible because that's the optimized one. It's definitely better than your for loop that you write uh, to animate or whatever you use. So, CSS. And uh, what is it called? CSS, transition, or something like that. It is the library that React Group yeah. created. CSS transition. CSS transition, yeah. yeah. Which is basically adding and removing classes, and then you style the animation with classes. Um, what about standardizing the way of you writing the code? So everyone is using code reviews, but aside of that, are you using any kind of linters or something that enforce the way you write the code for styles? Um. Automation for styles, obviously, auto prefixer, you don't want to do that manually. Uh, style lint, which I, which I think is a must. And now, 
I don't know how long ago, but they even allow you to fix automatically your properties, kind of like like what you can do with East Lint and uh, Prettier and stuff like that. So yeah, automate as much as you can, I would say. Uh, we're using, we, it's a plugin for Atom, and I don't know the name of it, I don't remember it. It actually um, just makes you, um, it obligates you to start uh, putting the um, CSS classes from the inside to the outside part. So maybe like um, the padding goes first. The, I started working on it like when I started uh, in Olalud, it was one month ago, and uh, it just tells you all the time, like, you are doing it wrong, <laughs> and you, it tells you, like, where it has to be first, you know? But it um, just yes, works, like, uh, I think the color f goes first, the, um, if you extend any class in, CS in SAS, it always goes first, the um, width and height goes uh, in the la last time, and uh, and I don't know, it just, actually it's just for having cleaner, um, cleaner code. I'm a huge fan of all automatic tools that can fix code for you, because it's perfect. Uh, it's normally real pain to introduce it into the team, because team normally says like, ah, a lot of things to fix, uh, especially if the tool is not allowing you to fix them automatically. But thanks lately like to style lint fix, CS lint fix, and especially prettier, for example, you can just save the file, and it will like be the benevolent dictator and says that it's the only way we are writing this. And it helps a lot, especially on the um, pull requests, because people are starting concentrating on like big picture and not like, ah, it should be a single comma, not double comma, or something like that. Um, and yeah, that's why I believe that as much tooling as you can put on top and then write, uh, run them on CI or pre-commit hook on Git or whatever, it could help you a lot. And especially if we're talking then about types and typing CSS is also a cool, cool thing. Uh, we use Prettier, which is probably, probably the best tool we have. Great. Uh, we put in uh, continuous integration, so if your code doesn't follow Prettier, you're not going to merge. Uh, we don't really have any style lint, uh, yes, lint rule or anything like that because what we found out using CSS and JS is that if you're writing more than 10 uh, lines of CSS, you probably need to split it. So the CSS is so small that it's easy. It's easy to understand, it's easy to figure out if there is something wrong. So. Um, from my side, that's all. Maybe you have questions to each other. I see we have, we have a lot of questions there, no? Uh, yeah, well, mostly we, we answered them. Oh, okay. It's mostly covered. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think, I think like, uh, from a maintainability side, um, what I see with BAM, what is kind of a downside, is that like you can still have like the dependencies between your components and your style because you can import your style and component and they're somehow linked. If you remove the component, it goes away. Um, but yeah, I think definitely with the CSS and JS solutions, uh, you have more options to t detect, especially unused codes that you still have reference in your code, but it's actually not used because you can, like let's say in style components, if, if one of those uh, wrapped uh, React elements is not used. Actually, IDE, IDE is putting it in gray, right? Unused uh, element, things like that. So that would that's actually something I really like uh, from the CSS and JS solutions. Uh, and yeah, maintainability is also a big part because like writing a small app is maybe easy, but if you write a big library, a big platform, uh, at some point it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So now it requires discipline understanding everything, but tools, um, the more you can animate that, the better, of course. Yeah. I'm talking about maintainability. Uh, lately, I was really hyped about the new thing. It's called functional CSS. Uh, it's Initially, I think, uh, and when I was showing it to other developers, the reaction was the same as we were when React came out. Like, what's putting HTML in, in JavaScript? I thought we already passed through it and all of that. But the mantra was, like, give it 15 minutes. So the idea of functional CSS is like that you don't need CSS. 
is that you have classes kind of for everything already, uh, and then you just compose it, like passing classes to, to your components or whatever. Is that if you know, for example, Bootstrap, uh, there is like, the good example is margins. So if you have like margin uh, bottom, it will be like MB-3 uh, or something like that. And now imagine that you have all possible combinations already prepared for you. If you want like rounds, um, rounded corners, it will be like something RC2, and two is like two pixels. RC5 will be RC5, uh, like rounded corners, five pixels. And you can like have elements and rules for all of that. And then what you are go going to do, just like, okay, I have a component, I have my design. Now I just need, okay, I need some margin here, I need some padding, I need some different colors. You just like adding classes to your divs and just that. You're not writing CSS itself, you're not writing even CSS and JS or whatever. It's initial reaction, obviously, like, what the hell? What are we doing? And why do we need it? But the cool thing that as soon as you have everything prepared, you have already your grid, uh, that you configured by this um, functional CSS. You have your ty typography there, you have all the paddings and margins standardized. There is no way to shoot yourself in the foot. You could not write now, okay, now margin will be like four pixels and designers will then come and say like, why it's four, it was like five or 10. I was like thinking differently. Ah, I, I forgot to measure. You cannot do that. And the cool thing also is that you are not going to duplicate your CSS because all classes are already there. So you're loading like 16 kilobytes of all possible variations and then you are just doing this. And even better thing, as soon as we're talking about components and separating everything, you're writing all these huge lines of classes only once in your component. And then you're reusing components. And that's, that's kind of beautiful. Uh, so yeah, I was kind of really hyped when I uh, got understanding of this and now I want to play and play with it, with it more. Yeah, it's totally different strategy. I'm saying it's not CSS modules. It's like it's a different thing. I'm just like saying that it's a new guy on town. That could be interesting to see. The the thing that I I, I only checked out uh, Tachyon is mm -hmm. the name. I, I didn't check others out. The thing I didn't like about that again the story. If you consume your code with others, and they need to not access the root element but an element inside your component, what are you gonna reference that, that element, that HTML element by, that's going to be tricky because the only classes there are margin or display. No, but or it's not saying that you couldn't, like, it's totally blocked for you to write CSS yeah, or anything like that. Yeah, yeah you I can know. add, like, any other classes on top and reuse it and do whatever. But there you come kind of in the battle, like, you start adding classes. So you have, like, this really functional, low or non-specific yeah. functional CSS, and then you mix it with more specific and you can kind of get in the way. But other than that also, I, I'm always a big fan of, of, of keeping your classes semantic. Mm -hmm. This is like the total opposite. I, I actually, I never tried it, huh? so I would like to try how it is. Um, but I see one issue there. If, if you have semantic CSS and there is gonna be a redesign mm -hmm. or someone adds another breakpoint to, like a mobile breakpoint suddenly is added instead of, then you have to, not only change your CSS, but also your HTML or your JavaScript. Like, you have to completely change everything because everything is so low in specificity that the order of your classes actually matter. Mm -hmm. So that, that was for me, uh, but I would like to try it out because I think the, the simplicity is really nice, the restriction, and you don't have to think about it. It's, it's really what you see is what you get. Um, but yeah, these are were the, were the, my doubts that I had. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, functional CSS because how does it work uh, with media queries? Uh, you have all of your media queries already prepared. So it's like as the same as a bootstrap, you have like LG and like or MD and stuff like this. So you just like write in, okay, what's the size of the grid should this element uh, use for? And then it will be like... So you, dec you declare uh, or that... Um, yeah, they already declared. The only thing that you need, you, if you want to configure it, just like, okay, what my media point, what my breakpoints are and stuff like this. So... Every, uh, all other stuff already prepared for you by like, there are a couple of libraries, that, but the biggest one is Tachyons, and Tailwind CSS is kind of the new one, but uh, it's, it's also really popular. And in terms of semantic, it's interesting, it's not my great idea, just like the author of Tachyons, because he was asked the same question, but what semantic means? Because if we want to talk about like really the idea of this sem uh, semantic is that that could be consumed by machines. 
So classes that consume, that you write just like my header logo or something, something, it's not really consuming machines, it's for people. But this functional thing is kind of more clear to idea of semantic than what the, what classes uh, people are writing normally. Because it's like really for machines LG3, MB5, or something, something, something like that. But I totally agree with you that, for example, for tachyons, you obviously need cheat sheet to understand okay, what's, what's the help is uh, what the hell is happening because it's kind of really hard to. to I, I don't think pro the problem is the machine. I think it's for me as a developer. Yeah. Instead of going and see oh div class panel, it's a panel. I go div class and I have padding five padding to a pad which describes the panel. Yes. So you can extract that to a component, uh, mm -hmm. uh, etc. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that oftentimes what we do, uh, we, we are uh, creating a component that needs uh, a little styling inside, yeah. mm -hmm. and we don't create a component for just three run of CSS, we just create a constant mm -hmm. uh, with style components, yeah. etc. cetera. Uh, so Maybe it, it can work with functional, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can work the same way with functional, just like adding classes. But the cool thing about like separating panel and this strange way of uh, writing classes is that when you just, imagine you have only HTML, you don't see CSS, and you don't see the browser. You're just like reading, okay, header, something, something, then avatar, my great avatar, or whatever. You don't like see the representation until you open the browser or until you open CSS. If you have this line of classes, you already can imagine, okay, this is back BG blue, so it's going to be background blue, then the margins could be like this, so you already can start imagining things before it's even rendered. So yeah, that's why maybe it's even easier to start compose from user perspective. Personally, I just prefer to have a style. style Wait, uh, and what about states? States is you you either adding classes or removing classes the same way. So you are also in the inside the classes. Yeah, no, it's states. because you have you have imagine you have like uh, classes and then you have a huge list of them. But if something button now disabled, you just like adding class disabled and it's done. Which is one thing I don't like about CSS modules. You have a lot of logic to add and remove classes and toggle them. <coughs> That's one thing I don't like. So you actually have to do that with JavaScript yep. to add and yep. remove calls. Okay. Yeah, regarding semantics, I, I, I think for semantics, for me, I always think uh, of the case of media queries. You can put like the exact media queries or you can just have saying what it should be. This should be the footer and you, you do the media queries inside the footer. So and you can make, you can put a completely different style sheet and it, it looks totally different, but the, all the semantics are the same. It's still the footer, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean with semantics. And when it's consumed by machine, machines, I think more of, of like metadata and, yeah. and things like that. So, yeah. uh, what about media queries in style components? How do you solve the problem with the, with the mobile browsers? You just create media queries like you would do in CSS. Uh, but basically, <laughs> Like you can still define a media queries uh, value in the CSS you define. What we are doing now is um, uh, our some of our components receive properties uh, that is that are arrays basically or objects that are mapping. Like I don't know. Uh, I was we have a spacer component that is basically adding space where you need it, and it can be a space six, for example. Or it can be space six on large, space uh, seven on everything that is tablet or smaller, and then you just redefine it with uh, with media query CSS. Uh, but in the end, like all the CSSs get rendered, uh, well, like the whole thing with all the media queries get injected into the head, or it depends on the device. Uh, no, everything is uh, is in the browser, like all the media queries. I guess you could do some uh, detection of, uh, well actually we have one component that does that, is instead of relying on media queries, is uh, checking the viewport width, and uh, deciding if it should render or not. Um, it's, uh, it depends what, what you need to do. It might sound slow, but so far we didn't have any issue. Okay, uh, if nobody else have questions here, uh, because like all the questions that we had, uh, most mostly we were covered. Um, yeah, maybe you can you can suggest anything trending right now, like on the internet, and what we should take a look on so people can learn. 
Uh, one thing that caught my eye, I tell you it was released last week, uh, is a statically typed CSS library that came out called Stylable, uh, which looks pretty interesting. It, it, it claims to replace everything, uh, as always, in the front end world. Um, but what I specifically like about this one is that they used the pseudo selectors in a way that it's still compliant to the specs, in, and it was, yeah, it was quite creative, and, and, and they used those pseudo selectors to actually like reference the, the elements in the component. Check it out, stylable, look pretty cool. Mm, I think we have covered some of this stuff. Uh, I also take a functional is CSS. And um, it was uh, the first time I felt like, what the fuck is this? Like, sounds so crazy to do it in this way. But you actually explain it very well and it makes sense. So, I don't know in, anything else that we haven't covered before. My advice and like, my advice will be just like to try the new way of doing things. And because yeah, it's like, is it could be functional if you're doing CSS and just looks like into like other approaches, or if you're using BAM, just like try to use into CSS modules or whatever. Um, because just like even playing on your pet project or maybe production code, depends on you, uh, could bring a new, a new ways and new visions to, to your ways of writing the code all way. Uh, uh, quite boring, actually. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't really like the new cool thing. I like the thing that makes me sleep at night because pleasure duty doesn't go out. So one, two tools that I really love lately are Prettier, which is amazing, and Create a React app. Super easy to set up a project and everything. Uh, yeah, I agree with Ilya. Like, keep looking at what's going on, what's, what's happening. There are a lot of new ideas. Uh, one thing is that if, I, if a new idea is better, you don't necessarily have to switch, because you also have to pay the, the price for, for the switching. Yeah, and well, in the end, it, like you said, it's good to get to try everything, but you have to realize everything has trade off. Like BAM suit has trade off, CSS models have trade off, and style components as well. And it depends on the project in the end and what's your use case. So always keep that in mind and not jump on the next back thing because it's very yeah. hipster it's to painful. do so. <laughs> It's painful. Exactly. Like so keep that in mind. Angular 1 decided to change the API. <laughs> it's a totally different project now.